in our world. Chaos and war and pain. And in our own individual lives, we got stuff. And so what do we do with it when we come to church? Well, we don't leave it at the door. Um, we also don't make it God. We don't put it on the throne, right? We allow Jesus to be on the throne and we bring all of it, whatever it is, to his feet. And we remember who he is. We, re we recall his character. We recall his faithfulness. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going we're gonna to sing about who he is. We're going to welcome him into this place, into our gathering and into our lives and our world. And we're going to declare his praise. We're going to remember who he is. Let's take a minute now and just pray. Lord, we remember this morning that you are the king who is on the throne. You are the sovereign one. We know that when you look at the brokenness of our world, that it grieves your heart as well. And so we just ask, come, Lord Jesus. You are the only one who can bring lasting peace. We, of course, pray for the peace of the nations. But deeper than that, we pray for an internal everlasting soul peace for every person who is involved in the wars happening right now because when there is peace inside then it eventually leads to peace outside but the, when there is conflict inside it leads to conflict outside and so we ask Jesus that you would reveal yourself to people that many would be saved even now I know it sounds like a crazy miracle but that you would just turn people's hearts towards you and then in doing so, that we would experience peace on the outside as well. And for our own lives this morning, we, we ask for the same thing. As we set our eyes upon you, Jesus, that you would bring peace into every situation and every, every thought and every emotion. We choose to worship you now. Let's just sing this together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son.
Let me be singing 
why we've come today, God, to bless your name, to worship you, to 
hear from you. Thank you that you are the God that we can look to in the easy times and the hard times and the joyful times and in the painful times. And so in a world of so much darkness, confusion, disruption, we just invite you, Jesus, Prince of Peace, to come and do what only you can do. We love you. We give you all the glory and all the honor. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Well, hey, church, before you sit down, you got a couple minutes. Why don't you get to know something you haven't seen in a while? Introduce yourself. Good morning. Can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Oh, okay. <laughs> Good morning. Hello. Sorry, I took a moment for my microphone to work. <laughs> Welcome to Reality Ventura. If you're a first time visitor, we are happy you are here. We are now gonna continue our worship to God through giving. Um, for those of you who are visiting with us today, please don't feel obligated to give. But if this is your home church, um, we as Kingdom Family have the opportunity and joy to worship God through giving in one of several ways. Um, you could give online. Um, use the Church Center app to give, um, send a check, or you can place a check in one of our give boxes out in the lobby. And in our giving, we remember and reflect the radical generosity of God. We also want to encourage you to find two or more believers to pray with this week um, in a prayer group, as we will specifically be praying that we would see our need for the power of the Holy Spirit. To help navigate your prayer time together, we have provided an online guide at realityventura.com slash prayer groups. So this week, find a few people and pray. Um, and now I am going to highlight a few announcements about what is happening in the life of our church here at Reality Ventura. Um, first is we are having a bake sale. Please support our youth trip to San Francisco. We have a group of about 25 teenagers leaving for an outreach this Thursday to San Francisco to serve with City Impact. So head outside right after service and stop by their bake sale fundraiser to support and encourage them as they prepare for this trip. I'm sure you guys already saw all of the baked goods and they look amazing. 
Next is how should we think about cancel culture and equip event next Sunday? We live in a time when outrage and division are all around us. It's time to explore where this might be coming from and what the Christian faith can uniquely offer our cultural moment. Join us for a special event on this topic with Dr. Amy Orr Ewing next Sunday at 6 p.m. This is also a great opportunity to invite a friend who is curious about Christianity. So please invite a friend and be sure to register on our website. Um, next, um, community group leader interest meeting next Sunday. We are thankful for all the thriving community groups in our church, um, but the reality is that we need more leaders. If you are at all interested in potentially serving as a community group leader, co-leader, or host, please make it a priority to stop by the picnic tables after service next Sunday for a 15 minute interest meeting. So it'll be outside at the tables after each service. Now I'm also giving announcements, which means only one thing. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Anna Herring and I am the kids ministry director at Reality Ventura. Oh, that's very kind, thank you. But um, I am here to tell you that this summer, our kids ministry team needs your help. Now it might seem like kids ministry is always low on volunteers, but that is actually not the case. For this current serving season, the Lord has provided almost everybody that we needed in order to run kids ministry safely, which is awesome. So thank you, you guys, um, so much for um, hearing that need and responding. However, it has also come to my attention that you guys may not fully understand how the kids ministry serving seasons work and why I'm up here three times a year. So what is actually happening is we recruit at three strategic times throughout the year because there are three different serving seasons in kids ministry. We have spring, we have summer, and we have fall and winter. Spring is four months long. That's the current serving season we're in. Summer is three months long. That's the next one we'll be heading into. And fall and winter is five months long. So when volunteers commit to serve, they are committing to serve only three to five months at a time. Currently, like I said, we're in the middle of our spring season and it's now time to pull together our summer team. Our, of our spring team that we have, 46 are confirmed to recommit to summer. Um, but we need a total of 130 volunteers to run kids ministry safely and to not spread the volunteers too thin. This means, and this is a big number, that we are still looking for 84 more volunteers just for summertime. This is a big number. We are looking for people who love Jesus, who enjoy kids, and wanna see the kingdom advance through this future generation. The types of volunteer roles that we're looking for this summer are class leaders, class assistants, worship leaders, teachers, and more. And we are especially looking for um, hoping to find more sidekicks um, because we have a handful of amazing kids that need one-on-one -on -one support in their class. So if you are interested in serving for just three months this summer, please go to the Church Center app or apply at realityventura.com slash kids slash serve to fill out an application by May 1st. Um, as you can see, there is a meme to help you remember what the deadline is. Um, so please just remember that if you want to serve, to please serve by May 1st. Okay, so, and now as Bradley um, makes his way to the stage, please turn in your Bibles to the books of, book of Acts chapter one as we prepare our hearts to receive from God's word. Good morning, church. My name is Bradley and I have the privilege of serving on our visuals team. And today's scripture is from Acts 1, 1 through 11 from the NIV. In my former book, Theoph Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. 
On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Many of, men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who, was taken, who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. This is God's word. Thank you, Bradley. Keep those. Yeah, let's give Bradley some love. He actually read scripture at both services. It was so good. We had to have him twice. Um, keep those Bibles open to Acts chapter 1. Last week, we began a new series. Uh, normally, we go through books of the Bible, which we will do, but from time to time, we'll take a break to focus in on a particular topic and look at the key passages describing that. And so we're looking at what does it mean to know and experience the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer? Now, just a quick plug to supplement our series over April and May. There's a book we want to recommend. We're selling it at the Connect desk uh, out in the lobby. It's called Jesus Continued, dot, dot, dot. Great title. Why the Spirit Inside You is Better Than Jesus Beside You by J.D. Greer. There's a lot of books on the Holy Spirit that are great. This is probably my favorite kind of all-in-one, just kind of covers everything. If you want to know more about what we believe as a church, this is an excellent book to grab. We're selling it at cost. It's at the uh, Connect desk out in the lobby. Last week, we looked at what it meant to be indwelt by the Spirit, and this morning, we're going to look at what it means to be empowered by the Spirit. So let's pray together, and let's invite the Spirit of God to open our hearts to the word of God. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have not left us to live this life in our own strength or ability, but you have given us supernatural power to be changed from the inside out and to do the work you've called us to do. I pray today for every single person in this room that we would understand both our need for the power of the Holy Spirit and the abundant provision of that power through the presence of your Spirit and that we would respond in reliance and trust. For those that don't yet know you, we pray this morning the gospel would be so clear to them that they would believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the one who died for us, rose again, and will return. We pray all these things in his name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Well, on New Year's Day, millions of people begin their year by watching countless floats in the Rose Parade, beautifully and creatively decorated, drive across your screen in a remarkably organized fashion. But I learned recently that on one occasion, one of the most beautiful floats surprisingly sputtered out and quit, holding up the entire parade for what seemed like an eternity. While somebody could go, and fetch a can of gasoline. The irony is that the float that ran out of gas was sponsored by Chevron, <laughs> or as it was known at the time, the Standard Oil Company. And the irony for us should be easy to see. The float that represented vast oil resources ran out of gas. You can see where I'm going with this, friends. I can't think of a better illustration as an encouragement and a warning to the church, to us. 
A Christian is a person who represents an infinitely powerful God. But if we do not rely upon him, we will run out of power. Now, power is a tricky subject. We know that power can be used for good or for bad, to help or to harm. But according to the scriptures, the power that God provides is always purposed for good because it's intrinsically connected to him, who he is, and what his purpose is for the world. And so the Bible clearly shows us that true power comes by being united with God through the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit is pointing every person toward. Well, how does this happen? What does it actually look like to be empowered by the Spirit? Well, that's what the author of the book of Acts that we have open to chapter one is telling us. His name is Luke. The birth of the church is a movement of the Holy Spirit. That's what Luke is recording. The earliest history of the church, the earliest history of Christianity, essentially as a, a travel log of all these men and women who are following the Spirit as they share the good news about Jesus and provides remarkable lessons for us as to what it looks like, what it means to be empowered by the Spirit. So we asked this morning, how can we avoid living a powerless life? How can our lives, how can our community, how can Reality Ventura be a movement of God's spirit? What does this text teach us? Well, three vital lessons that I wanna point out today that we must take to heart. They're so simple and yet they are so important. And the first is this, we must receive from the Spirit. To live the Christian life, we must receive from the Spirit. What was the very first commandment that the risen Jesus gave to his assembled followers? What was the very first task assigned to this group of men and women who would go on to establish the largest religion in the world. What was his first command? Do nothing. Don't do anything. But wait. That's what he says in verse three and four. After his suffering, Acts 1 tells us, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. His first command is for his followers to wait. And I must say that there are few things that teach us about our need like waiting. Personally, I hate waiting. My wife, she's here, she can testify to this truth. I am the one in the family in the car, engine running, forever waiting for everyone else. Birthday party, we're the first ones there. <laughs> you going to see a movie? You know it takes forever for the trailers. It's like 85 minutes until the movie comes. We're there at the beginning because I hate waiting. I feel as if I'm being unproductive. I feel as if I'm not doing anything. Of course, that is precisely the point here in Acts chapter one. That all that God has called his people to do is impossible, Holy Spirit. Think about how hard it might have been for the disciples on that day to hear these first words of instruction. For days, 
they did nothing. But it's not because there was nothing to do. There was so much need, so much to be done. There were lives at stake. Jesus died, but then he rose again. They spent time with him. They saw the resurrected Jesus. They're thinking of all the things that Jesus had previously told them that they were going to be doing. And yet Jesus says, as clearly as he possibly could, first and foremost, don't do anything. But it is not because there's nothing to do. Keep in mind, a little bit of context is helpful. The Gospels clearly record for us that Jesus had been ministering for a little over three years, healing, preaching, leading, gathering, teaching, explaining, all the way to where he was unjustly tried and crucified on a cross where he offered his life as a sacrifice for the sins of the world and then rose again on Easter day when he defeated death and the power of the devil. And now before he ascends into heaven, he's been telling them that a new day has dawned. Men and women who would now follow Jesus and trust in him would be changed and would quite literally change the world. But first, don't do anything. But it's not because there's nothing to do. Because friends, he's showing them and us that our purpose cannot be accomplished by anything that we can provide. All that we need to live out the Christian life comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us remember that this should not have been news to the disciples. We learned last week, Jesus had told them on the night he was betrayed what life would be like without him being physically present. And the disciples were depressed. For like them, we would think of how hard and difficult it would be to live this new life in the kingdom of God without Jesus being physically present. If you were only there, if you were only beside me, they might have said. But that's when Jesus said in John 16, verse 7, but I tell you the truth, it is for your good or to your advantage that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor or the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. What could possibly be better than Jesus right beside them? The Holy Spirit inside them. That's what we learned last week. The Holy Spirit's presence is not the privilege of special believers, but a promise to every believer. When a person believes in Jesus Christ, in that moment, by faith, the Spirit of God takes up residence in their life. In fact, the Apostle Paul calls us the temple of the Holy Spirit, the very place where God dwells, a habitat for divinity, if you will. That's us when we believe in Christ. In fact, Jesus says here in verse five, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. We are to be immersed in the life of God. How is that gonna happen? By the power of the Holy Spirit. This describes what happens when a man or woman puts their faith in Jesus. You're immersed in, into the life of God. We had baptisms last week, and how wonderful was that? It was amazing to see those people like publicly declare Jesus Christ, and as a symbol, they represent that through baptism, where you get dunked in the water and you come out. It's a picture of your old life being buried, new life raised in Christ, but it's also a picture of immersion. Like When we baptize those people, we say to each and every one of them, we baptize you as Jesus commanded us in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And them being submerged is also a picture of you're going to be immersed in the life of God. Paul the Apostle would say later in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, for in one spirit, speaking of the Holy Spirit, we are all baptized into one body. And so we've learned that the Holy Spirit indwells every believer. 
upon conversion. But we must also be continually filled with the Spirit from that moment on. Now, more on that in a moment. But we must address how the disciples immediately respond to this staggering statement. In verse 6, Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Interesting. For their question revealed their continuing lack of understanding about the nature of the kingdom of God. Well, in what way might they have been confused? Well, their confusion is demonstrated in the noun, the verb, and the adverb they use. Ready to go back to high school? You're welcome. First of all, the verb. They say, will you at this time restore the kingdom? They were expecting a restoration of the previous iteration of the kingdom of Israel. A very specific geographic location. Then the noun, to Israel. They were expecting a national kingdom. Then the adverb, at this time, reveals they were expecting an immediate establishment of the kingdom. But Jesus had already provided so much clarity in his teachings about what people can expect about the kingdom of God. That it would expand beyond Israel. That was always anticipated in the Old Testament. That the Gentiles, those non-Israelites, would be brought into God's very kingdom. Jesus also told us that the kingdom would spread over time and often in surprising and subtle ways. If you read the Gospels, it's all over. Jesus said the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, tiny, barely noticeable, and yet it would grow up to be this massive tree. Jesus also said the kingdom of God would grow like wheat amongst the tares. Wheat amongst the weeds. That is, that as God's kingdom advances, also the human depravity will continue. And we all see that today. They will grow at the same time. Over and over again, Jesus gives them clarity about the kingdom of God. That it is for this world but it is not of this world. In other words, the way in which you're gonna live in this world is very important. It's not as if you get saved and then God just snatches you out of the world. You're here for a purpose. You are a representative of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is for this world. That's why we all have a job to do. But the kingdom of God is not of this world. Meaning we are not to do this job in the way that the world might do it or in the ability of our own flesh. That is a life operating outside of and apart from the power of God. We must receive from the Spirit. And this is not to be a one-off experience, but a lifestyle with a specific purpose. And that's the second point. Number one, we must receive from the Spirit. Christianity is impossible without the power of the Spirit. But secondly, we must rely upon the Spirit continually. So the disciples ask their question to Jesus, and I relate to them. Like, they wanted to know the details. They wanted to know the plan. They wanted the timeline. They wanted the instructions. They wanted to know exactly what to expect. Can you relate? I can. So much of my relationship with God is like, Lord, can you just give me the PDF? Can you just give me the outline? Like 2024, that's all I ask. The Lord's like, oh, right, yes. Okay, here you go. Um, I emailed it to you. This is what's gonna happen in April, rest of April. So I'm gonna do this thing. I'm gonna miraculously provide for you. You know, on the 22nd of May, I'm like, great, Lord, looking forward to that. It's going to be great. I'll put it in the calendar so I don't forget. Like, I want to know the details. And all the disciples are like, hey, we want to know exactly what's going to happen. We want to know the time. We want to know the seasons. Many of us right now, as our world goes crazy, 
We want to know, like, well, when is it, Lord? When is the end? When is this? When is that? When does this particular thing happen? And Jesus, so frustrating to us. But with infinite wisdom beyond us, says to them, verse 7 and 8, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. Pause right there for a moment. We think, no, it is for me to know. (laughs) Isn't that how we approach God? It is for me to know. Lord, I want to know the times and the dates that you have set by your own authority. I think I'm entitled to that. (laughs) But for God's vastly wise reasons, he says to them and to us, it is not for you to know. Now, friends, that's very important. Because have you heard that phrase, it's on a need to know basis, and if you needed to know, I would let you know? Have you ever had a boss say that? And you're like, whatever, of course I need to know. (laughs) Clearly, uh, this is hard to receive, but it's true. If Jesus says we don't need to know, guess what? We don't need to know. But then he goes on to tell us what we do need to know. But, verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. How powerful would that have been? He's like, hey, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons, but you will receive power. How often is it the case that when I'm looking for a very specific answer from God, like, God, what's this one decision that I need to make in like three weeks? God, I really want to know the details on that thing. And oftentimes the response of God to me is, you don't, you don't need to know that, but you need, what you need to know right now is you've received power to be my witness. Here in verse eight, Jesus makes it very clear why we must continually rely upon the Spirit, because we need power. We need power. Not simply for something we are called to do, but something we are called to become a witness. Now, Christians often use the phrase witness as an activity, and indeed, that's a part of it. You might even hear a Christian say, hey, I'm going to go witness this Friday, implying they're going to go out and share the gospel. But Jesus doesn't describe it as merely an activity, but an identity. He doesn't say, and you will be given power to do some witnessing. But you will be my witness. Now, what does that mean? A witness is at least three things. First of all, you are a witness to something. The people around you. You are a witness to, you're an advertisement, if you will, to the people around you. But secondly, you are a witness of something. Something that you've experienced, something that you've seen and that you've heard. These disciples have seen the risen Lord. They're a witness of Jesus And as a result, they're to be a witness to the watching world. And thirdly, unto. You are a witness unto, which is a continuation of the first two. Wherever God would take you, you continually do it. It's something that you will continually be. A witness of Jesus to the world unto the ends of the earth. That's what it means to be a witness. In short... The whole of your life will testify about Jesus. In word and in deed, we are to be good news people empowered by the Spirit. See, one of the great pieces of evidence that the Spirit of God is at work in your life is that you have a passion for the gospel. You want to be a witness of 
the transformative power of Jesus to the people around you, unto wherever he would take you. Some of you might ask, how do I know the Holy Spirit's work in my life? Well, one of the ways in which you know is you have this passion for the gospel. Like, oh man, the gospel, it's good news. It needs to be shared. It needs to be shared. But how do we do that in a way that's effective? Through a continual reliance upon the power of the Holy Spirit. It is worth noting the significant difference you see in the lives of these disciples before and after the Spirit comes. After receiving the Spirit that we learn about, if you continue to read through Acts, none of the disciples would tell you that it was better before. Because by the Spirit dwelling in them and empowering them, they would know the continual presence of Jesus with them at all times. So that when you live this life out and you are a witness of Jesus to the world, unto wherever he takes you, you know that something supernatural is happening. As D.L. Moody, one of the greatest evangelists in the history of North America, once said, there is no greater evangelist than the Holy Spirit. We preach to the ear, but the Spirit preaches to the heart. And any of you in this room that can remember the day that you made the choice to trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you remember when the truth of the gospel that's always been true became real to your heart. I remember. I'll never forget it. I was just sharing with our community group last week. I will never forget it. It was like the gospel that is true became so real to my heart. And I wasn't hearing the voice of the preacher It was God speaking to me. Isn't that encouraging? When you think about this task of being a witness, it's the power of the Holy Spirit. Think about your family member or your friend or your colleague or that casual acquaintance that you know through school or a neighborhood and they seem so shut off to the gospel. We'd be inclined to think, well, that's it. There's no way. Right? Think in your mind right now. I have a few people in my mind where even when I pray for them, I'm like, yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> it's as if I have a conversion- conversionometer. <laughs> like, what's the likelihood of this person meeting Jesus? Oh, well, 22% maybe. <laughs> that's not a thing, by the way. Paul the Apostle was one of those. In fact, if you went back in time and asked around about Saul, the Pharisee, say, hey, on a scale of one to 10, how likely do you think Saul, who's literally putting Christians in jail and approving of their death, how likely do you think he'd be a Christian? No, no believer at that time would have said, oh, that's a solid nine. <laughs> Nobody. Even, do you know the story? You read Acts, read the book of Acts. When Saul gets converted, it's incredible, right? Even Ananias, God literally speaks to Ananias, saying, Ananias, this guy Saul, he just got saved, go meet him. And and Ananias is like, wow, audible voice of God telling me? I'm still not sure. (laughs) Wait, sorry, is that Saul? Oh, Lord, yeah, no, that that can't be true. Because not even you can do something like that. And God's like, hmm. Friends, how does this happen? How does the church grow? It's not through some program like, hey, we've got to have some really slick music, adequate seating. The temperature needs to be just right, and then we get them. It's not how the church grows. Read church history. Look at our church. It's freezing in here right now. (laughs) But the Holy Spirit is at work, it's the power of the gospel. Nobody got saved because they're like, wow, you know what did it for me on Easter? The decorations. When I saw those flowers, I knew. I knew that tomb was empty the minute I saw those flowers. (laughs) Hey, don't get me wrong. I love some good flower arrangements. People work very hard to make those. How does a person 
cross from death into life as the Holy Spirit reveals their need for Christ. He's the greatest evangelist. But where might he take us to be a witness? Well, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. It's worth noting that this would include people and places that those disciples may have already dismissed. Just like you and I may have people and places that we've already dismissed as candidates for salvation. No, it won't happen there. Nah, it won't happen with her. Definitely won't happen with him. I imagine as Jesus said each one of those places, they went from like excited to not excited. Jerusalem, yeah, Judea, eh, Samaria, mm, ends of the earth, no. (laughs) Jesus said, this is where I'm sending you. See, one of the ways in which you know the Holy Spirit is at work in your life is not only that you have a passion for the gospel, but you begin to own the mission. You're like, I'm a part of this mission. Even to the ends of the earth. And as we rely upon the Holy Spirit, He shows us our place in this mission. He shows us our role in this mission. And he empowers us to fulfill it. But we need to rely continually upon the Spirit. We need to be continually filled with the Spirit, is the phrase the New Testament uses. Now, some of you might ask, wait a minute. You just said a person who puts their faith in Jesus has the Spirit inside of them. So why do I need to be filled with the Spirit? Why does a Christian who already has the Spirit inside of them, why do they need to be filled with the Spirit? And at this point, you may be thinking of an analogy that many teachers have used of a water glass, an empty water glass, and a big jug of water. Has anyone ever seen this? A few of you. The empty water glass represents your life. The big jug of water, God. The water, the Holy Spirit coming into your life. Metaphors always break down. Don't trip out on it. So the big jug of water fills this cup full of water. But if it's already full, how can it be filled again? I would suggest a water cup is a dumb analogy. (laughs) But don't take my word for it. Take Wayne Grudem's word for it, author of his systematic theology, he says this, someone might object that a person who is already full of the Holy Spirit cannot become more full. If a glass of water, if, if a glass is full of water, no more water can be put into it. But a water glass is a poor analogy for us as real people. For God is able to cause us to grow and to be able to contain much more of the Holy Spirit's fullness and power. A better analogy might be a balloon, which can be full of air, even though it has very little air in it. When more air is blown in, the balloon expands, and in a sense, it is more full. And so it is with us. We can be filled with the Holy Spirit and at the same time be able to receive much more of the Holy Spirit as well. You're all balloons. You're welcome. You're like, what if it pops? Analogies break down. (laughs) You will not pop. You will never find anyone who says, you know what? I just was too full of the Spirit. And if you do, just ask their spouse, because they'll probably say, no, they definitely were not full of the Spirit. (laughs) We need to be continually reliant and dependent upon the Spirit, who makes the gospel personal and the mission personal and empowers us to carry it out. Now imagine inserting your name in this passage. Make it personal. Tim, you are called to be my witness. You, fill in the blank, are called to be my witness. You know the Holy Spirit is powerfully at work in the church when the gospel and mission of Jesus becomes personal for every member. 
So, friend, do you know what part of the mission belongs to you? Have you asked? There's no spectator Christianity. Has this grand mission of Christ become personal for you? I'm amazed when I read the book of Acts and the birth of the church, how the gospel spreads often through ordinary members of the church. Ordinary men and women, extraordinarily empowered by the Holy Spirit to be a witness in every aspect of life. So think practically. Think about your career in relation to the mission of God. Ask for the power of the Holy Spirit in that area. Think about your friendships and relationships in relation to the mission of God. That's a part of your witness. Ask for the power of the Holy Spirit to carry it out well. Think about your money in relation to the mission of God. Ask for the power of the Holy Spirit to lead and guide how you use your money for this mission. All of life is to be a witness. How? By the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, how do I rely upon the Spirit? Well, we're going to talk about that in many ways over the coming weeks, but let's keep it simple for now. Seek to do what Scripture says and ask for the power to do it in prayer. Let's start there. Seek to do what Scripture calls you to do, and in prayer, ask for the power to do it. Prayer is one of the most practical aspects of this. You see that pattern in Acts. They pray and they are filled with the Spirit. They pray and they are filled with the Spirit. They pray and they are filled with the Spirit. Because in prayer, we are relying upon God. Many years ago, over 20 years ago, when my wife and I made the decision to join reality, to plant a church, Britt Merrick, who was the lead pastor at the time in Reality Carpinteria, and along with the team, we'd agreed, yes, we're gonna move to, to Los Angeles. We're gonna move to Hollywood, and we're gonna plant a church. And I said, hey, what's the next step? I was thinking, we'll just move to LA, and we'll just start a Bible study. And Britt said to me, no, you're gonna move to Carpinteria. I said, I don't like Carpinteria. I said, you're moving anyway. I said, why? I said, because we're gonna pray for a year. And at first, my flesh was like, no, just get it started, man. I'm like waiting. And he said, because nothing of kingdom significance is going to happen apart from prayer. And so we moved and we prayed every week for a year. As we pray, it was one of those lessons. I had to wait. I had to wait in prayer. When we pray, whether it's on your own or in a weekly prayer group or in a larger meeting, it's an intentional way that we recognize our need for the Spirit of God. Seek to do what Scripture says and pray and ask for the Spirit's power to do it. That's how revival comes. It's through this crying out to God. It's showing our dependence on Him. Prayer, if you're looking at this in the most human terms possible, prayer is a waste of time, right? Right? From like a non-spiritual, non-Christian perspective, prayer is a total waste. Why would you pray? Just get out there and do it. But if we really believe that God hears our prayers and he acts in response to our prayers so that he gets the glory, we get the good, and that we become more dependent on the spirit as we pray, then it is absolutely non-negotiable. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was one of my favorite preachers from the last century, who wrote many books, preached in London, wrote a lot on revival. He said this, conservatives would rather work to reform church theology and practice. Intellectuals doubt supernatural intervention. Rationalists dismiss emotional enthusiasm. All convene committees and organize campaigns, but few will plead for revival. What would it look like for us to pray and to plead and to ask to become more effective? God delights to answer. 
You might say this morning, well, I don't feel comfortable sharing the gospel or I'm not that good with confrontation. I'm not really good with my words. I understand. And it always reminds me of that moment, if you read the Old Testament, where Moses is called by God to represent the people of God to Pharaoh and Egypt. And Moses says, I'm not a good public speaker. And God said, who made your mouth? And Moses was like, you win. Okay, that, that makes sense. That scans. I don't feel comfortable with this. Well, right. I don't have what it takes. And friends, I say this to you in the most loving way possible. You do not have what it takes. <laughs> Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> right? You're not going to hear that. You don't hear that in the culture. It's like, you've got this. In the Bible, it's like, you don't. You absolutely do not got this. <laughs> but by the power of the Holy Spirit, everything changes. By the power of the Holy Spirit, the world can be turned upside down by ordinary men and women who are following Jesus. It's incredible. In fact, Jesus said that any person empowered by the Spirit in his kingdom has a greater position than John the Baptist. What? Jesus said it in Matthew 11. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet, the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than him. It's an echo back to verse five. John's message was a message of repentance. But unlike John's baptism, people who trust in Christ would receive the Holy Spirit. We must rely upon the Holy Spirit. So where are we drawing our power from? We must receive from the Spirit, rely upon the Spirit. But this is not about some kind of impersonal force. And that's the third point. We must relate to the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, not an it. He guides us, helps us, speaks to us, and manifests God's presence among us. But oftentimes we relate to the Holy Spirit like we relate to our internal organs. We know they're there, we know they're important, but we don't often think about them. But friends, the Holy Spirit is a person. To experience him is to experience God. It is possible to know him and grow in greater and deeper dependence upon him. It is also possible to grieve him and to quench the Holy Spirit. The believer is told to walk in the Spirit, rejoice in the Spirit, pray in the Spirit, and that by doing so, it is possible to experience greater joy, peace, patience, God, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. If we don't relate to the Spirit, we will end up exhausted and burnt out. And it is so easy to do when we think about all the work that must be done. For sadly, we often view ourselves as workers first and worshipers second. But that's not Christianity. In Christianity, it's the reverse. We are worshipers first and workers second. See, doing God's work is not about what we can do for God in the world. It's about doing what the Holy Spirit leads us to do. The weight of the mission rests on a God who has no needs, but a God who is relational and who loves us. See, God does not use you because he needs you. He uses you because he loves you. It's not as if God's like, you know, it's the draft season and he's trying to put a title winning team together and he's like, oh, if I could just have a right tackle for the kingdom. Like, oh, she'd be great. And you're like, I know, but it's gonna cost you. Like, I was like, oh, but it's just not gonna be as effective without you. God is not thinking that. He does not call us out of need. He calls us out of love. For he is a relational God. And if you operate out of this place relating to the spirit who fills you, you will experience this joy 
as you work because you're working from overflow. That's why Jesus said in John 14, verse 16 and seven, and I will ask the father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. See, the great commission is not something we accomplish for God. It is something we accomplish with God. All of life flows from worship, being with God. All ministry flows from intimacy. That's why Peter, when he was preaching the gospel and people were getting converted, he said in the book of Acts later on, chapter three, verse 19, he says, therefore repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from what? The presence of the Lord. It is as we turn to Christ that we experience the refreshing work of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit always shines the light on Jesus. The strength that we need for ministry to others comes from Christ's ministry to us. How does that happen? By the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit continually reminds us that in the gospel, God gives us himself. Ultimately on the cross, Christ gave himself for you on the cross, gives you forgiveness, gives you new life, and gives you the presence of his spirit. so that we might continually rely upon what he gives by drawing near to him and asking. In Luke chapter 11, Jesus says, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Do you feel dry spiritually? discouraged, tired, powerless, exhausted. Good news. You are a perfect candidate for a filling of the Holy Spirit. Your need is his invitation. Will you reply with a yes? I pray that we would. Heavenly Father, I pray right now that this all would not be merely academic but that we would respond to you. I pray that your spirit would shine a light on the areas where we need to rely upon your power. For some, that could be our marriages, our parenting, our parents, our friends, our spouse, our work, our neighbors, serving in this church, I pray that you would reveal our area of need that we might come to you and ask for you to fill us and give us power. Knowing that we can through the gospel of Jesus Christ. The work for us to have access to you has been finished and accomplished through the cross and the resurrection. So I pray that nothing would hold us back, but that we would draw near to you and ask freely. And for anyone who's not yet accepted Jesus as Savior, I pray that they would do that now and realize that there is no salvation anywhere else but in Jesus Christ. May they believe right now and be saved. Spirit of God, would you move? We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Friends, the Spirit is always drawing our attention to Christ and his finished work. And we have the opportunity to respond, to remember that, that this is not about what we can do or have done for God, but what Christ has done for us. Come and receive communion. It's available here on the stage. The symbol of the bread and the cup represent Christ's body broken for you, his blood shed for you, the gift of salvation freely offered to you at infinite cost to himself. Come and receive. It's like as we physically eat, we're feeding by faith 
on Christ. Come down to the carpets and lift your hands in, in worship, like palms out, like I got nothing, <laughs> right? There's something beautiful about physical posture and worship. Like that's why we often hold our, our hands like this, because we've got nothing, <laughs> but we're ready to receive. Come and worship. You can kneel on the carpets and by all means, come to pray with the men and women to my right and to my left on the prayer ministry. They're wearing the prayer lanyards. You can't miss them. Where do you need power in your life? Where do you need power in your ministry? What area do you feel exhausted and dry and burn out? Come up and pray with them. What have you got to lose? Come and pray and just say, man, I need the power of God in this area of my life. Don't let anything hold you back from praying today. And as we sing, let us lift our voice to the God who gives us the greatest gift by giving us himself. Let's cry out to him, let's praise him, let's adore him because all ministry flows from intimacy. So let's draw near to him now.
today I need you more More than words can say I need you more Than ever before I need you Lord I need you There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen. Of the sweetest of loves When my heart becomes free And my shame is undone In your presence, Lord oh.
fall on a Whatever area of your life there is where you're just like, man, I, I just, I need more of the presence and power of God there. Why don't you just identify it for a second? We're going to sing this again before we move on. Why don't you just identify that place? Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a situation. Maybe it's some kind of internal thing happening in you. And you are just aware, especially of your need for the presence and the power of God in that identify it and I just open up the door to that place and as we sing this we sing Holy Spirit you're welcome here let's make it about that whatever it is Holy Spirit you are welcome Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord.
The king of my heart 
Jesus said, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? What a wonderful God we serve. Let us be those who ask as we go. Heavenly Father, we do ask for more of you, more power in our lives to be your witnesses to wherever you would lead us with the power that you provide. May we be dependent people, spirit-filled, testifying to the life-changing power of the gospel of Jesus as we go. We love you and we're so grateful for this good news. In Jesus' name, and everyone who agreed said amen. Let's give it praise. We love you guys. God bless you. We'll see you next Sunday. Be sure to encourage the high school team as they're selling their baked goods, getting ready to go to San Francisco on Thursday. We love you.